feeling, this feeling of squeaky clean inside. A little bit of a taste of heaven. And for those of you who have given your hearts to Jesus Christ, genuinely surrendered your, your lives to Him, you know what I'm talking about. And there's times when um, we have this taste of heaven. Oftentimes when people first have their conversion it's just like the grass is greener, the flowers are brighter, the lights get turned on inside, and it just feels so, so good. Now, before I start into the subject of my message today, I want to emphasize there is absolutely nothing that is wrong with basking in the presence of God with a clean slate and a clean heart. That's a benefit of being a believer in Jesus. Now yesterday I was contemplating an old song that it just wouldn't leave my mind. It resonated in me concerning the river of life that the Holy Spirit brings to us when we're saved by Jesus and we're set free from our sins. It feels just so good to be free. It's like a whisper of eternal blessing that God has in store for those who, uh, who serve Him. It's just a taste of what is to come. Now James tells us in James chapter 1, verse 17, he says this, he says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Now, if you're a Christian long enough, you realize that you don't always have those feelings. Right? There's times when it's, it's tough, right? Time for, from time to time, the Holy Spirit permits us to taste of the heavenly blessings of the life to come through our Heavenly Father's gift. That gift is just that. It's a gift that God has given us, but it was never meant to be our primary motivation for living for Christ. God refreshes us. He gives us these sheltered times from storms in life in the wake of the storms and the waves that come at us. But the Lord's desire is that we mature in Him past the point of feelings. If our view of pleasant feelings becomes a primary motivator in our pursuit of God, it is inevitable that we become like a small child who is given a lollipop as a treat and uh, God gives it to us as a gift. But we decide in ourselves as a child that we should be able to dine on candy delicacies as a steady diet. And how gravely disappointed we are when the, when the Father refuses to give us a diet of confections. Our Father calls us to a table to dine on food sometimes that is less than sweet but is filled with nutrition to help us grow spiritually strong. Now when I speak of feelings this morning, I'm not speaking about the promise that God gives to His children to give us a deep and abiding peace as they walk through life. I'm not talking about that. Or the joy that, that abides with a saint who is walking in step with the Holy Spirit. I'm not talking about that. Those are promises of God that that will abide with us. We can abide in the joy of God if we step in, this, in step with the Holy Spirit. The peace that surpasses understanding guards our hearts and our minds. But what I'm, what I'm talking about is, is because of these experiences of freedom and, and these wonderful feelings, if, if one embraces Christianity and continues in this seeking of experiences in order to continually have lofty feelings, it turns us as believers into consumers who become, I guess you would say, obsessed with self-care and self-preservation. Now, through the book of Philippians, particularly in chapter 2, I just felt this was on my heart today, we see the crystal clear message from the Apostle Paul giving the church in Philippi an invitation to adopt the attitude of the Lord Jesus Christ, suggesting that 
the message of the gospel is not just about my personal growth and my personal feelings. No, the message of the gospel is not primarily about me, myself, and I. It is about the glorification of God and the bringing of many sons to glory. See, God has given us this window in time to sow the seed, and the Spirit uses us to sow seed into the world, and the Spirit does the work, and we speak the Word of God, and, and the, the Word of God plants into the hearts of people, and God's desire is that, that grain will sprout from this, and He'll be able to gather a good harvest into His barn. That's, that's what this is all about, because God loves the world. So much that He gave His one and only Son that who believe, whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is, this is paramount in the mind of God. This is why, this is why Philippians chapter 2 encourages us to take our eyes off of ourselves. It's a natural default to care for ourselves, right? And when we're not feeling well, we care for ourselves. When we're you know, we've got to go out and earn a living, so we care for ourselves and our families and those closest to us. It's natural. It's a natural default. But Philippians chapter 2, starting verse 1 to 8, says this, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value yourselves above, about, uh, sorry, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature, God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and, becoming, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. So when we read that, the Apostle Paul is making it very clear that in the Christian life, when you come to know Jesus, there is an encouragement. There is comfort. There is tenderness and compassion given to the believers from the Holy Spirit of God. It is so good. But in response to what God has done for us, Paul is suggesting that we not become hoarders of these good things, but cause all believers to consider other people more important than themselves. Even though it's counterintuitive to how our old natures are hardwired, when, when we are saved, we're given this new nature. And we're called to yield our, our, our members, yield our body and our, and, our, and, our, and our mind to the Holy Spirit. Our true purpose in life as believers is actually found when we give ourselves away for the sake of the gospel. And this is what Jesus meant in Matthew chapter 16, verse 25, when he said, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. It's counterintuitive to the flesh, to the ways of this world. It's counterintuitive. But this is the way of the cross. This is the way of Christ. This is what God's calling his church to. And this is why the Apostle Paul encourages the believers in Philippians 2, 12 and 13, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Wow, powerful. Isn't that scripture powerful? What's God's purpose for the church? He works in us to will and to act according to His good purposes. It's not trying to maintain a level of self-comfort, nor is it to create a colony of self-preservation. 
Our purpose is greater than this. It's eternal in nature. It is a mission to see other people come to know the Savior, Jesus Christ, and to grow and become mature disciples, followers of Him. And Jesus said to His followers before He ascended into heaven, in Matthew 28, 18-20, right? We're familiar with this commission. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Me. Therefore, go and make, what? Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you always to the very end of the age. In Philippians 2.14, the Apostle Paul continues instructing the believers in this right thinking. In this verse, he continues to instruct them, asking them to align themselves with the will of God And the will of God is that they do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, consider others to be better than ourselves as the servants of God and of His gospel. Man, I have a hard time with that. My flesh doesn't like that. Yours doesn't either. We have a hard time with this, right? This is not denying ourselves, picking up our cross, and following Jesus. That's that's tough business. But God does not, you see, God does not leave us alone in this. He doesn't leave us to try and figure it out on our own through our own mental reasoning and intellect and all this kind of stuff. He says this, right? And surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. Wow. Philippians 2.14 to the first part of 16 says, Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. Wow. You see, it's easy for us to be controlled by the flesh rather than the spirit. We can, we can get sidetracked and step out of sync with the Holy Spirit. And as a result, when we do this, Our testimony for Christ can be tarnished by, what is it? It says here, do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. So when we step out of sync, our testimony for Christ right, can be tarnished by complaining and arguing. Now each of us has inherited a lot in life, right? And God has placed within us a sphere of influence at home, in our community, in our schools, if we're students, in our job, if we're working or in a church, right? wherever we are. And Paul instructs in the church in verse 14 that the believers ought to do everything without complaining or arguing in order that they could become blameless and pure children of God without fault. That's God's desire. Because it's crooked out there. It's depraved out there. It's dark out there. We see this in our society, right? The depraved generation that's growing up around us. Look at the state of the world. Look at how it is. And in the midst of these dark times, the fact that the Apostle Paul gives this order in his teaching means that there's a propensity even for Christian people to deviate from God's pure intention for them. His pure call to them. It's, there's a propensity even for Christian people to allow the flesh to reign in them and, and have the wrong heart when they do what they're doing. When we see the corruption around us, our natural reaction is grumbling and complaining and arguing about things as life drama comes at us at full force. And the Apostle gives an order here because he senses the danger. He senses the danger of our natural propensity, all of us, to fall into patterns of this complaining and arguing. God help us. All of us. This instruction was given to prompt the church to let go, and to let God, to pursue obedience. Because, why? Because the testimony that we have for Jesus Christ is of paramount importance. Our testimony as children of God requires that we be marked by joy in His service, not characterized by the bitterness that comes from complaining and arguing. And when it comes down to it, when we do anything that we do through the Bible, 
we are taught that one principle needs to be our primary motivation. Can anyone guess what that one principle as our primary motivation is called to be through Scripture? What's the primary motivation that we're supposed to have? Love. Exactly right. Exactly right. There is no higher principle that needs our attention and primary to be our primary motivation than love. For the true believer, absolutely everything we do in the Lord needs to be hinged on this principle. Jesus said in Mark 12, 30-31, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is, is, is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There's no command that's greater than these. And love is not our natural default. It's not our natural motivator. That is, in the Christian, okay, love is a byproduct of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. You see, love is the first, I guess, the first aspect, the first characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit manifesting in the believer's life. Love as motivation leads us to follow the paths that Jesus exemplified when he walked the earth. When we walk to his drumbeat, our priorities end up changing. Our, our testimony for Christ becomes a primary concern when love becomes the motivation for everything. You see what I mean? Because we want people, what? To be saved. We want God to be glorified because He's worthy. We want those that are struggling to, to gain strength, to those who are battered to be healed and raised up. After all, the true Christian message is that Jesus Christ brings salvation. He brings healing. And He brings deliverance from the powers of darkness and of sin that have corrupted the planet. And that is something God wants us to have in the core of who we are. He delights when we live in this state. But let me tell you, and you guys understand this, right? Individually, right? When God calls us to this, someone doesn't like it. Someone does not like what's going on when we start to, to get this into our spirit and we start to act on it. There's nothing more irritating to our spiritual enemies than to see us yielding our entire being to God and, and having that effectively overflow into a ministry of service to other people. He doesn't like it. I mean, the Scripture speaks of a battle that rages. <sighs> Our, the war will ultimately be won. Our adversary, the devil, and his angels and his minions, de, you know, they desire to steal, kill, and destroy, but God will have his way in the end, and they, they will be the ones that are in fact destroyed. But they, they want your testimony to be killed, squashed. They want to steal your joy and replace it with sour grapes of grumbling and argumentative spirit. Because our testimony is at stake. It is important for all of us to make a stand against the enemy. Because God has given us the provisions to stand firm against him and not to allow him to gain a foothold inside of us. Ephesians 6.10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. He's scheming. He's scheming against you and I and the church as a whole. He's scheming. He's always scheming and conniving and trying to fool and lie. Right? That's, his, that's his nature. He's the father of all lies. And he understands that the obedient saint is the one who will be effective and productive in the propagation of the gospel. And we are called to be effective as ambassadors of that gospel. Have you ever noticed that uh, you know you can live a Christian life and through God's grace, you're able to overcome the sins of the flesh and you give that over to Him. God, give it over to God. And it's just like, yeah, things go so much better. You're so much peace inside. You're, you're living in a way that pleases the Lord. 
But once that happens, the devil's objective is to plant lies in our paths and turn our attitudes sour and our motives sour. Because if he can turn our attitudes and our motives sour after he succeeded in developing this bad attitude in us or, or seeing it happen, I guess we don't have to let it happen, but he, he, he tempts people to get them onto that track, right? Because if he can get that happening, he lures us away and then goes back to getting us to sin in our actions again. So this is, our, this is the nature of the, of the fight, right? He tra- when we overcome, and we're living in a way that pleases the Lord, he tries to poison us. And then before you know it, if we allow that to happen, we fall back into sinful activity and actions. The Lord is calling his saints to arise. See, God has given us provisions to stand strong. We don't have to be bowled over by our enemy. As a matter of fact, he's given us everything we need. The Lord calls his saints to arise. Take the promises of the Lord's word in hand. Affix the spiritual armor. You can see it in, 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 in the Bible. It talks about it in Ephesians. right? Take that spiritual armor that God has given you and affix it. He's given it to us to wear. And God will help us to be clothed in it. He'll give us strength to be clothed in it. And he'll give us strength to wield his sword, the word of God, in a way that penetrates to the very core of issues. It tells us the difference between flesh and, and the soul and the spiritual things. Right? It separates. It tells us what's of, of just the human soul and what's of the spirit. It's the word of God that penetrates. The spirit uses that to do his work. And he calls us into service to walk with him. So we're at war out there. But it's not like the war that we think in, in natural terms. 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5 says this, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments in every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. And there's another significant truth in 1 John 4, right? You dear children, you're from God and have overcome them because the one in you is stronger, is greater than the one who is in the world. What a promise. You see, yeah, he can run around and poke at us and everything like that, but don't forget this. Your God is greater than anything the enemy can throw at you. He's greater. The power of God has overcome the power of darkness. Jesus Christ has ensured this. This is something you can take to the bank. Don't be afraid. Don't be filled with fear. Allow the Lord to, to, to well up within your spirit a spirit of strength. A spirit of, of power and might. Not that it's in you, but it's in Him to overcome all of the obstacles that are thrown your way. James 4, seven says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Hey, there's no, no Christian alive that I've ever met that hasn't at times faltered with this, right? <laughs> yeah, we need Jesus. And sometimes, you know, when we're broken and our weakness is on our shirt sleeve, we look down and we go, God, I need you. I need your grace. I can't walk this walk alone. I can't, I can't live in a way that pleases you. I need you. And it causes us to fall to our knees and call out to him and dig into his word and call out for his strength and his mercy and his wisdom. And when we do that, he does not refuse it. He gives us what we need all the time. Resist. Submit to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. If we fall into that trap, and in this case, in the text that we're in, of complaining and arguing, okay, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. The nice thing about being in the grace of God is that He gives us mercy. 
when we need it. We need it on a daily basis, don't we? I do. We all do. We need this. So, again, God has not abandoned us. Second Peter 1.3 says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who calls us by His own glory and goodness. I like that. By his <laughs> he gives us what we need because He calls us by His own glory and goodness. You realize the work of grace isn't something that you can manufacture inside of you? It's a gift of God. It's totally from Him. And there's freedom in that because you realize that the Lord is responsible for every good thing that happens inside of you. And that, that's the secret to living a victorious Christian life is, get, is it getting an understanding of this. And in, in response, responding to the Lord in love, saying, Lord, I want to obey you because I love you. Relationship is so important. It's not all about rudimentary do's and don'ts. It's like, God, I love you, and because I love you, I want to serve you, and I want to obey you. And because what you've done to me, I, I pray that you'd help me to help others find the same beautiful things that you've shown me. Paul tells the Romans in Romans 12, 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The world needs to know what we're for. It really does. Because it doesn't see. They're blind. They need to know what we're for in the attitudes and actions that we present. In the end, God promises His church will be overcomers. If you look at the book of Revelation and, and you see in Revelation chapter 12, this is kind of the finale. Like it's, it's a picture of the finale. And this is something to, to grab a hold of and be encouraged by. Because God's going to take care of all this wickedness around us. He's going to take care of it all. Hallelujah. And one day, he's, it's all going to be consumed and taken away. Revelation 12, 10 and 11 says, And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now have come the salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down. He who accuses them day and night before our God. They have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much as to shy away from death. That's the finale. Beautiful. Victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. Right? This is where it's heading. Our testimony and the overcoming of evil that Paul speaks to us about is by walking in saving grace and the strength that God gives us pursuing good works out of a pure heart of love for God and genuine love for our fellow man. See, God doesn't say don't have good works. He just says that's not the source of your salvation. The fruit of salvation is, in fact, good works. It's just that sometimes we get it mixed up, right? The Pharisees tried to get the works first without surrendering to the Lord. The grace of God gives us dunamis, the power of the Spirit, to overcome and to be the loving people that He's called us to be. And it just means that we have to step with Him and yield to Him. And the purity of love that Scripture exemplifies to us is in so many different stories. And, and one in particular is that story of the Good Samaritan, right? We're familiar with the story, most of us, where the guy gets beat up and left for dead on the side of the road and this good Samaritan comes by, picks him up, loads him on his ride, takes him, takes care of him. We're, we're aware of this story, most of us. And if you're not aware of it, it's a good story to go, go searching for. Open your Bible, look for it. Good Samaritan. The Samaritan man didn't receive approval from anyone and he didn't do what he was doing to bolster his own self-esteem. He went outside simply to display a heart of compassion and love for the person that was bruised and beaten on the side of the road. On the highway of life. Now what do you suppose that Samaritan's testimony would have been with the innkeeper? That's a good thought, eh? Would the innkeeper see the actions of the Samaritan as being blameless and pure? Yeah. 
He had nothing to gain. The Samaritan had no accolades that he was getting from this. He just did it because it was the right thing to do because he loved. That's what God's saying. This is loving your neighbor as yourself, right? When our testimony for Christ shines like a star in the universe, things are happening as they should be. This is a lighthouse. You are the light of the world. City on a hill that cannot be hidden. Therefore, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven because they need to see the church arise and shine like stars in the universe. They need to see us shining when we obey and we abandon the default when things don't go our way of complaining and arguing. Right? Paul's suggestion was that God's blameless and purity comes when godly action is accompanied by righteous attitudes. This is the truth. When ordinary people like you and me obey God and act righteously with good attitudes towards our obligations uh, toward God and our ministry towards others, we become blameless and pure before Him without fault. Yeah, they may persecute us. They may say all manner of evil against us falsely, but it's just, it's false. Because we're shining. We're living in obedience to the Lord. And again, I want to emphasize this. You can't mentally ascend in your human willpower to be this kind of person. You can't do it. This comes from abiding in the vine. It comes through spending time in in, in the presence of Jesus, meditating on His Word, Asking Him, Lord, have Thine own way in me. Have Thine own way in me, Lord. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me. This is what I pray. Change my heart, O God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O God. May I be like You. You are the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me. This is what I pray. You know, beautiful. That's where God's calling our hearts. Verse 13, for God, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to His good purpose. A life controlled by the Spirit brings peace, brings life, brings the everyday world around us. People are, are uh, like, look at the world, right? Grumbling, complaining about everything. Workplaces, you know, think about your workplace. If you, you know, if you work in a in a job with a bunch of other people, right? There's all kinds of things. People grumble about their wages. They grumble about that they got to work extra hours. That their conditions aren't right. That the lunch break isn't right. The, the, the it just goes on and on and on and on. The employees deserve more. You know, like it's not just that, but you know, ev- everything. You look out there. People, you know, talking about fires and, oh, my goodness. It, it's, just, it's just always at the forefront. If you don't complain, but do your work cheerfully, as unto the Lord, you know what? You're going to stick out like a sore thumb. You are. Some people might not even like it. I mean, oh, are you goody two shoes? What's wrong with what's wrong with you, man? <sighs> Stick out like a sore thumb. Why do you always have to be so positive all the time? Don't you see that we're getting ripped off here, man? We deserve a ten hour ten dollar an hour raise. What's wrong with you? You don't ever join in with this. Yeah. Yeah, you might stick out like a sore thumb. But when someone's world falls apart at work, guess who they're going to come looking for? They're not going to go to the guy that's uh, griping and bitter and angry at everything. They're going to seek you out and say, what is it that makes you tick? Why, Why do you have a different view? You see, this is being the light of the world. God designed for us to be practical 
in carrying this out, in, in our attitudes, in our actions, in our motives, out there living them out, no matter where we are, work, school, whatever, in their community, at the coffee shop, wherever, right? It's a calling. We need to be strong in the Lord and His mighty power to be obedient and to do what is right here. If we choose to submit our hearts to the Holy Spirit and obey the word of the Lord in the strength that He gives us, we will be overcomers and no weapon formed against us will prosper. It doesn't matter if they throw you into the den of lions. God is with you and He'll stand with you. And you can be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who said, O King, know that we will not bow down. Our God is able to deliver us from this fire, but even if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow down. Right? Yeah. Testimony. When we choose to believe God's word for what it is and obey the Holy Spirit, he guides us into all truth. We're in effect, when we do this, putting on the full armor of God that he provides for our protection and for advancement in his kingdom. The one whose heart is humble and soft towards God will be aligned with God's heart for others. The believer will have the heart of Jesus in imitation of Paul. Because Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ, right? The dominant view of our world is that people need to pursue um, what makes them happy and at peace with self. And we look at our state of society and that philosophy has really got us a lot of, a lot of good places, hasn't it, really? No. It's a disaster. Selfish people pursuing selfish ambitions with the goal of self-gratification. There's very little happiness out there and even less peace. But Jesus has given us the truth that sets us free. It tells us to lay ourselves down in service to God and to others. And when we do this, there is great happiness and great peace. I guess great joy would be the better word. Great joy and great peace. So, Matthew 5, 6, 15 and 16, Jesus said to his disciples, Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Amen. Let us pray. And could I get the musicians to come forward? Lord, we thank you for the provision that you've given us to walk with you and to abide with you. Thank you for cleansing us and for, by your grace, calling us to be participators with you in your divine nature, Lord. I thank you that we can live in such a way that pleases you, not by our own might or power, but by your Holy Spirit living within us. God, we pray that you would help us. Forgive us, God, for the times where we allow our, our feelings to rule us. God, we live in terrible times. And you know how, how it is out there. God, you are here. And you see everything. But God, help us to, help us to, to live in such a way that we shine like stars in the heavens as we hold out the word of life. And God, may you make this church effective in presenting your gospel to those that need to hear. God, we pray for your mercy on us, Lord, that we would, we would follow after you with hearts that are surrendered fully. Collectively, individually, Lord God, that we would just commit today to live in such a way that our lives reflect your love. And God, whatever that means, help us to go out into the highways and the byways and find those broken and beaten people along the roadways of life. And help us, give us the wisdom to know what to do and to be able to pick them up and put them on our ride and care for them, Lord, and, and, and do this with the right motive, Lord. Thank you, Father, for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for all the people here today. And thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.